Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us over on Twitter at Radio Detectives and give us a call, 208-991-4783. Before we do get started with today's program, I want to let you know that every weekend we post one and uh, past few weeks it's been two different uh, articles over at greatdetectives.net. And these are things I think uh, listeners to the program would appreciate. We've got reviews of mystery books. We did the Columbo Collection. A lot of Nero Wolf. Father Brown. And then we also take a look at radio shows. Not only just uh, detective radio shows, but other types of radio dramas, many of which are overlooked or little known in the uh, old time radio circles. So every weekend you can check greatdetectives.net and get another uh, article or two about the golden age of, age of radio, classic television, or a mystery book review. And you can also receive these articles directly, automatically on your Kindle. And you can try that service out uh, free for two weeks. Just put Great Detectives of Old Time Radio in the Amazon search box and it'll come up for you. Well, today's episode of Let George Do It is called The Brothers Macintosh. Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Standard Oil Company of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. The Brothers Macintosh, another adventure of George Valentine. Dear Mr. Valentine, I am a butler in a very fancy house, though perhaps I ain't the usual type for butling. My bosses are two brothers, the brothers McIntosh. I've been with them ever since I was a busboy in the first cafe they ever owned. What a joint that was. But now they're a success so big it hurts your eyes. Bill McIntosh used to be a cook, and it must have given a sour stomach. Because there's a guy what hates everybody. But I mean everybody. And it's plenty mutual. Bill's brother, the sweetest guy in the world. This Mervyn McIntosh is a prince, a real gentleman. With good words and a wide open pocketbook for everybody. Friends, I tell you, Mr. Valentine, there's nobody who ain't. Except that is, of course, whoever is that wants to kill him. But how can you ever get a man to admit he's in danger when he's so big-hearted he'd slap the devil himself on the back and say, have a cigar? That's my problem, and I need your help. Yours most sincerely, and it's signed, Jasper Butler to the Brothers McIntosh. <laughs> Sounds like he thinks one of these guys is going to kill the other one, doesn't it? Sounds like he's crazy or punch drunk. Jasper Butler to the Brothers Ma... What's the matter, Brooksy? George... The postmark on the letter is Harbortown. Oh, that's important? Well, there's been something about Harbortown lately. Something? Maybe this letter isn't crazy at all. I remember now. It's, it's something Lieutenant Riley was talking about. Riley's out of town, Valentine, but I checked up for you. Thanks, Devlin. There's some kind of an investigation going on down there on the QT. Uh -huh. Small-time rackets of some kind. Nothing to do with us here in Homicide. A racket investigation. I thought that happened years ago in Harbortown. It did. They blew the lid off the place about five years back. Sent a big shot named Fillory to the pen. Fillory, Fillory. Oh, sure, I remember. Well, how about the name Macintosh? That mean anything? Cafe owners. The biggest roadhouse owners in the state. At least Mervyn is. He's got a sour apple brother, I guess. Kind of got pushed out of the business. You know, that's what I don't understand. What do you mean, Devlin? 
Well, these Macintosh boys got their start at the same time Fillory went broke. Same time he was... Well, go on, go on. Hey, wake up. Hey, Devlin, come back to the party. I'm here, I'm here. I'm doodling on the morning traffic report. Huh? 3.30 a.m., Sugar Canyon Road, 1949 convertible, went over embankment. No explainable reason for accident. Single occupant. Uh, no, that's his brother. His what? Hey, what are you talking about? You got a letter said this guy McIntosh might be killed. Here, listen. Listen to this. Car rolled over five times, completely demolished. Single occupant, only here's what I mean. Bill McIntosh. Oh, I get it. Wrong guy. guess what, Valentine? He lived through it. No, no, I don't want to see you. I don't want to see anyone. Get out of here. Lie still, will you please, Mr. McIntyre? That goes for you too, Doc. I don't need all them bandages. Emergency hospital already slapped well, enough on Mr. me. Mr. McIntosh, we, we don't mean to intrude. But your butler here, Jasper, tells me I can't see Mervyn unless I first see you. So you want to see Mervyn? Well, that was the original reason for coming here, but... We, we don't like to bother you when you've just been in an I'm accident. I'm all but... right. I just got scratched up a little... Doc, you're all finished. You poked around enough. I'm going, I'm going. You too, Jasper. Go on, yes, go on. Sir, I'll show you to the door, Doc. <laughs> Friend of my brother's. Sucker won't even send us a bill. Your brother seems to have lots of friends. Maybe. But you're not one of them. Maybe. I know all about you, Valentine. Jasper told me about that letter he wrote you. He's an idiot, an idiot. Yeah, well, he's worried about your brother. Follows him like a dog, the idiot. Anybody who ties strings around people or lets other people tie strings around them. Mr. McIntosh, maybe the doctor shouldn't have left. Nothing wrong with me. Driving alone, car flipped over. I was thrown clear. Scratches and bruises, that's all. I want to see you. I want to see anybody who hasn't been given a glad hand or a free cigar or a slap on the back. Jasper out there is worried that he hasn't caught on yet. You don't know what I'm talking about, eh? Well, Jasper, Jasper thinks my brother Mervyn is just sleeping late today. What are you talking about? Look, last night I answered the phone. And then Mervyn came home and went out. And then afterwards I drove and I drove and I looked and I looked. I got more and more scared at what I'd done. Mervyn keeps a cabin cruiser down in the harbor, but she was anchored in the same old spot with no lights. I looked every place, from the railroad station to Sugar Camp. Hey, wait a minute, calm down, will you? Get back to that part. You got more scared at what you'd done. What had you done? Do you understand a man having enough to drink and being scared enough that when he sees a sharp turn coming, he just plain doesn't make the turn? Just lets the car go over? Your accident. You mean you were trying to kill yourself? I mean, I've always hated my loudmouth brother. No, I was just excited and I had some drinks and I was scared and I... Maybe I did he is my brother. Abel and Cain, that's us. You better clear this up pretty fast, Buster. Know how to take dictation, miss. What? Oh, yes, I do. Uh, go ahead. A confession. Yes, a confession. The keeping quiet when I could have spoken and prevented my own brother's death. His death? Yes. My brother, the great Mervyn McIntosh. Friend to everybody. Well, he seems to have one enemy. A man named Fillory lost his shirt when we came to this town, and apparently it wasn't just because Mervyn had glad-handed him out of the nightclub business. Then Fillory went to prison. Why? Who knows? My brother Mervyn is honest, not a squealer. But for some reason, Fillory has threatened to kill Mervyn, not once, but 50 times. Fillory, uh, go on, go on. Well... Philly was released from prison yesterday. Last night, a, a, a wire came to the house from a friend telling us about it. And that's where I've been in. While I'm sitting here reading that wire, the phone rings and a little polite voice says he'd like to see Mervyn out in a lonely place. About some business, the voice says. And then it happens. Mervyn comes home. I give him the message, but I don't show him the telegram. He leaves. 
I don't tell him that that phony voice was really the voice of Fillory waiting to murder him. I don't know why I do it. A couple of hours I just sit there and wait and sweat, but then I can't stand it any longer, so I go out looking. And I find the meeting's already taken place. And all I can find out is that Mervyn's green sedan has been seen leaving the place with Fillory in it alone. Don't you see? I let my brother walk into a trap. I let my own brother be murdered. Take a week to find Mervyn's body in all those woods. Yeah, it'll take you a lot longer than that to find Fillory. Brooksy, Fillory did come in on the train, and we confirmed the part about his making the phone call. And afterwards, the kid in the service station was pretty sure of the description. Green car driving away quickly up this road. George, certainly the police... Well, we got a head start on the police. We might as well use it. George, I wonder why that butler Jasper wasn't at home last night so Sure, he... sure. We'll ask him sometime. I notice how the traffic funnels through just a few roads here. Uh-huh. Boy, what a town this must be when there's a parade. You know, Fillory's had such a head start, and the highway patrol's already looking for him in the city and beyond. Yeah. So suppose you hop on a bus and tell the rest of it to Lieutenant Devlin. What, George? Brooksy, the guy in a green car is supposedly running like mad across the country, only the trail dies in every direction. So maybe I got an idea. I'm going to take a little drive right around here, up the country road right by the beach. Oyster Cove. And a green sedan parked right on the pier. What's your trouble, Bob? Huh? Oh, uh, nothing. I was just wandering around. How's the fishing? I don't know. I'm looking at boats. Yeah, yeah, sure. Some pretty ones, all right. Say, uh, you didn't happen to see anybody getting in or out of that car over there, the green one? Yes, but as a matter of fact, I did. Me. Uh... You? Me. Is that all right? I was talking to a guy named Bill McIntosh a little earlier, and he That's said... so? Never happened to meet the man. Now, just slow down, Buster. You're Fillory, aren't you? Is there a law against it? Whatever rotten branch of the law you spring from, but I assure you, my parole papers are quite in order. Not so fast. Let go of my arm. Let go of it, I said. Get away from those steps. Here, here, here. what's going on? Fury, stop that. Cut it out, both of you. Why, huh. you got a crew, huh? No, no, just Tony, a young fellow that helps me out. He's out there now, getting the boat warmed up. Who are you, chum? What's your name? Oh, oh, oh I think we can do without names on a hot day like this. I suppose you just run along, young man. Sure, and your sure. You guys aren't interested in murder. In what? Murder? Well, if that's the case, perhaps I'd better... My name is Mervyn McIntosh. Now, what do you mean, murder? All right. So you are Mervyn McIntosh, and you are alive. But how did Fillory get your car? Because I loaned it to him last night. I had to see about the boat. My crew's are out there. He doesn't need to know that. Oh, now, take it easy, Fillory. He's not a reporter. He doesn't need to know any of it. Cool off, Buster. Fillory, please. I'll show you how I cool off. Hey, you... Oh, look what you did. He was a nice young fellow. No need to I'm do in a thing. hurry, McIntosh. I came to talk business. Remember? Relax, will you? We'd like to find somebody to look after the boy. Leave him there. Business, I said. Oh, people should be friendly. <laughs> Fix the boy comfortable. There we are. Now, pick up your suitcase and we'll go aboard. We're going to be friends, aren't we? Here, have a cigar. Where on earth have you been? Oh, don't even ask me, Brooksy. Where all good suckers go, I guess. But, darling, it's practically midnight and the police have been... I don't care what's been happening. Besides an ice pack, all I care about is getting my hands on that Bill McIntosh. That crazy, hooked-up story of his about his brother being in danger, being dead. But, George, listen to me. The police have been calling. Bill McIntosh was right. What did you say? The Coast Guard up near Oyster Cove. They just fished out the body of Mervyn McIntosh. <laughs> We'll return.
return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Which tire on your car is the most important one? Ask the car savers at standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations. They'll tell you the oldest, smoothest tire is most important because that's the one that will probably cause trouble first. And at any of these service stations, they'll be glad to add to your tire safety before you go out on crowded highways. They'll be glad to explain why new Atlas Grip Safe tires give you extra protection. They'll show you the wider seven rib tread of these tires with their ground gripping edges that put more skid resisting rubber under your car. You'll be both money and miles ahead by turning in risky tires for new Atlas Grip Safe tires. Because a new Atlas tire is a protected purchase. It carries a double written warranty for 12 months. One, against tire damage from any road hazard, and two, for workmanship and material. And this warranty is honored on the spot by 38,000 dealers from coast to coast, many of whom are open 24 hours a day. Friends, why gamble with your own safety? Ask about new Atlas tires tomorrow. Ask at your independent Chevron gas station or standard station, where they say and mean, we take better care of your car. And now, back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. The brothers McIntosh. One of them no one likes, and the other one called everybody in the world his friend. The only trouble is, big jovial Mervyn, whom you talked to only this afternoon, now is dead. Dead just as his brother Bill expected him to be. Dead just as their strange butler, Jasper, warned you Mervyn might be in the letter he wrote. Still, if your name is George Valentine, the case has not worked out in exactly the way you anticipated. In fact, as you return to examine the body with Lieutenant Devlin, you're convinced that nothing makes sense. Yes, yeah, same guy I saw, all right. Struck over the side of the head, huh? Yeah. Coast Guard found him floating in the water of the bay. Mm-hmm. As I figured, Valentine Fillory got chipped out of his roadhouses and maybe his little rackets by the glad hander here. Yeah. Yeah, there might have been holes in this friendship stuff. Of it? course there are. Nobody was ever as popular as this bird supposed to have been or as nice to everybody. Fillory gets out of prison and kills Mervyn. Yeah, after the big boy manages to stall Fillory at their first meeting and so suckers himself into being bumped off in an even more secluded spot. Mm -hmm. What about the boat? Well, it's just a drift out there someplace. All this fog and so many little bays along the coast, it'll take us a little chance. Why a drift? What makes you think Fillory isn't still aboard? Uh, you haven't looked back at the road at the end of the pier, have you? Why, what do you mean? What's the... Oh, no. Oh, yes. The green sedan isn't there. That's what happened to Fillory. He's got away again. Well, have they checked in Arizona, the used car lots? Well, maybe... then stop blaming yourself for this case. I got over that two days ago. I only asked it's you It's a police things... case now. Even if we haven't done any better than you did, I'll allow Miss Brooks. Hello. Oh, George, about the steamer Guadalupe. The what? Go on, Angel. Foreign registry? As foreign as they come, three miles out, and you're as safe as a seal. The freighter, so no questions asked. When's she leaving? This afternoon, 4 o'clock, Pier 73. That's the other side of Harbor Town, so there's plenty of... Will somebody on. please you tell me... You finally persuaded me Fillory's the kingpin in this case. That's all, Devlin. What? If he'd really planned on killing Mervyn, then he's also smart enough to have planned how to get away, how never to be caught. Okay. Tell me the rest. Hillary had already booked passage a couple of days ago to sail on the Guadalupe this afternoon. Well, come on, come on. What are we waiting not for? Not so fast, Evelyn. Not so fast. Get men down there just before 4 o'clock. But in the meantime, lay off. Stay away from the place. Yeah. Yeah, maybe you're right. Uh... Angel, you and I have to go pay a social call on the poor guy that nobody likes. Town. Great. Bottleneck streets, bottleneck murder case. But they'll certainly be able to make Fillory talk no, when he won't. shows up at the boat. What'd you say? I said no, they won't. Brooksy, this is the right street, isn't it, for McIntosh's? Well, yeah, just up the block. Hey, I... hey, look, look. 
Just parking in front of the house there. My nemesis, the wild goose I chased. George. And let us park right behind him. Good, that's it, Brooksy. Yeah, the green sedan, the special job. Uh, now, now, George, be careful. Never mind. You stay behind me. But you'll see you first. I don't care, let him. It's a 50-50 chance, Angel. And from where I sit, that's good enough. Well, hello there. Oh, hello. You looking for me, mister? Maybe I am. You had the car, didn't you? Well... Yeah, sure, George, but I... what on earth is... The wild goose, Angel. I finally remembered something Mervyn said about a one-man crew. About a boy who was out warming up his boat. Well, that was you, wasn't it, Buster? You're Tony, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, I'm Tony. L- look, I've always worked on that boat, only... Well, I, I didn't even know anything was wrong until I just read yesterday's newspaper, and, and Mr. Mervyn loaned me his car. You mean you stole it, Tony? Hello, darling. Oh. No. No, I didn't. Honest, Mr. McIntosh, your brother said that this I could... This kid's been in trouble before, you Go on, kid, you tell it. Well, a couple of days ago, Mervyn came down to the boat at night. He'd had a meeting with some guy giving him the car. And... Hillary? Well, I-, I didn't know who it was then. Just somebody who didn't want to be seen coming through the public pier at the yacht club, I figured. Anyway, uh, Mervyn had slept on board that night and... Uh, why didn't he call the house? The blasted, inconsiderate... Well, look, I-, I didn't think he wanted anybody to know where he was or what he was doing. Next morning, he told me to pull out, and we went up the coast to Oyster Cove, where it's quiet, to pick up the same guy. It was, Fillory. Yeah, yeah. They were going to go out fishing for a day or two, fishing and talking, I guess. Only they didn't want me along, so Mervyn, he said I, I could take the car for the weekend. Gee, he, he was like that, you know, always giving you everything. It's like I used to be in trouble, see, until he hired kid, me. And... Kid, kid, the police of ten states have been looking for that green car for two days. Where'd you take it that they couldn't find it? Was it was in a garage, mister. My my girlfriend's garage. Gosh, it's the first weekend we've had off together in a year. Of course, I want to see Miss Brooks and the kid, Valentine, and we have plenty of time now that our little party at the freighter's been canned. What are you talking about, Devlin? You remember that little black suitcase you saw Fillory carry? Yeah. Well, something must have backfired with the jailbird's plan because the Coast Guard had finally located that cruiser. Come on, make sense, will you? It was dynamite. The cruiser had blown up. That's what killed Mervyn when something hit him and knocked him overboard. And guess what else, Valentine? You got another body aboard the boat. Yeah. At first, I thought it might have been a deckhand. Only now you'll have to check the fingerprints we and find out... We already have. It's him, all right. It's Fillory. The guy whose plan to blow up Mervyn blew right up in his own face. So there you are, Valentine. The end. Fillory's dead. Yeah. Big loss, that is. Of course, I never met the man. I wonder if your brother had him out on that boat trying to make a friend out of him. He'd have offered the devil himself a cigar. Doesn't pay, though. Sooner or later, you reach out to pat a dog and it bites your hand off. Yeah, I know, I know. You don't like anybody. I'm not apologizing. I was wondering if you really did try to commit suicide that night. What's that? Well, it would have been so easy to push your car over the cliff and give yourself a few scratches and bruises and... Pretend that you've done it. Wait a minute, Valentine. Oh, no, you don't, Buster. And don't argue with a gun. Why, you... I wouldn't trust you any further than I could throw a piano. You're not going to shoot at me. You're not going to kill me in cold blood. Stand still. You are soft in the heart like Mervyn was. I told you to stand still. Hey, Jasper. Get up here, Jasper. Oh! Oh! (laughs) You see, I've got a gun, too. And now you have it. What's the matter? Hurt your arm? What do you think? I suppose when Jasper gets here, you'll just... The house is empty, Valentine. You sent Miss Brooks and the kid away. And Jasper, he's a sentimentalist. He's changed his shirt by now and gone to my brother's funeral. All right, sour puss. Now, you were saying something, weren't you? No, it's the things you say. Like just now, you said that you never met Fillory. I wouldn't have even noticed it if he hadn't told me exactly the same thing about you. Never met the man, he said. So maybe it's true. Well? Well, it doesn't quite fit with something you said in that ridiculous confession of yours. That you recognized the voice on the telephone the other night as being the voice of Fillory. Mm, you're a smart boy. So that guilty remorse of yours was all fake, wasn't it? <laughs> it's a 
pretty good guess. You bet it is, Buster, and I'll keep on guessing, too. You knew why Fillory got sent to prison. Maybe even planned it, sure. Sure, you were trying to duck out before Fillory and your happy-go-lucky brother ever got together to check notes. But they got together on that boat. Where you knew they'd be. Yeah, you're the one who made sure that boat would blow up the minute they were on board. And then you cooked up the cock and bull confession stuff. Just on the off chance the murder might be blamed on Fillory. Shut up! Why? You're planning to pull that trigger anyway, aren't you? Get rid of me and still try to get away with it. Try to get away with it? Fillory had a getaway plan, remember? Well, who do you think really made that plan, using his name? And who do you think they're expecting aboard that freighter at four o'clock? And now there's no welcoming committee either. I might have known. Got every possibility covered, haven't you? Except maybe the clock. It's only ten after three. And Pier 73 is only just the other side of Harbor Town. I'll make it all right. How? Oh, you wrecked your car. In you can't... your car, sucker. I haven't admitted anything, have I? I told you, I'm not crazy. There won't be any evidence. Well, you didn't pull the trigger on me, so I won't pull it on you. <laughs> you don't mean you're going to commit a friendly act. Valentine, I've never done anything in this world for anyone else. And I haven't asked anyone to do anything for me. My brother loved the whole town and vice versa. And where is he? And where am I? <laughs> Turn around. That's it. It shows how much friends can do for you. <laughs> now you know what a guy like me can do. Just keep the useless strings off you and you can get all the way to China. Get your thumb out of that horn, buddy. I'm sorry, officer, but what's the matter with that man up there? He won't move. And I won't let him move. Can't you see there's a funeral going by? Keep your shirt but on. But I've got to get across town, you idiot. My boat sails at four o'clock. I'll miss the boat. I said cut it out. Take your hand off of that horn. Hey, Joe. Joe, what's the matter? Ah, uh, some kind of jerk, that's all. Can't stand to wait for a funeral go by. Huh. Ever see such a crowd? We'll keep on all day. That Mervyn McIntosh was quite a guy. How do you like that? Bill gets caught because he can't get by his brother's funeral. George, are you sure you're all right? The doctor said... I don't let the bandages scare you. Valentine, I don't want to say anything, but... Uh, but what? Well, a guy who lets himself get beat up, knocked down, dragged... Well, look, you got your man. You even got a screaming confession out of him. What difference does it make how he was caught? I'll take it easy. I didn't mean to. You want me to say I had him corralled. All I would have had to do was shoot. Why didn't I do it? Sure, I know. I'm some hero. Darling, now, please. Well, maybe it's the kind of guy I want to be, Devlin. Not a hero, just a sucker. Valentine, all I started out to remark was, fearless Fosdick may stop a lot of people from eating beans, but me, <laughs> well, me, I I wouldn't have shot either. Good for you, darling. Huh? Hey, what is this? She's kissing me! If your car drags along as though you were driving on a sandy beach most of the time, it may be the fault of gummy gasoline, which is robbing your car of power. A sure way to get that new car feeling is to use Chevron Supreme gasoline. Most raw gasoline contains impurities that form power-robbing gum. Chevron Supreme is the gasoline that's super refined to remove engine-sticking gum. So to get and keep that new car feeling, ask for this premium quality gasoline. See how it gives your car new power and full mileage in the kind of driving you do. Ask for super refined Chevron Supreme gasoline tomorrow at independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations where they say and mean we take better care of your car.
Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Robert Bailey is starred as George. Let George Do It is written by David Victor and Jackson Gillis and directed by Don Clark. Virginia Gregg appeared as Brooksy. Ted DeCorsia was heard as Bill. Larry Dobkin as Fillory. Ed Begley as Mervyn. Ed Fields as Jasper. Pat McGeehan as Lieutenant Devlin. And Anthony Barrett as the Kid. The music was composed and presented by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Uh, the Whistler was one of radio's longest uh, lasting programs. It, it aired from 42 to 55, and it featured stories where you would follow a murderer or an embezzler as they committed their crimes and they thought they were going to get away from it, away with it, and then a twist, and they were undone. Uh, and Jackson Gillis, who wrote for Let George Do It, uh, wrote uh, seven episodes of The Whistler uh, from 1947 to 49. And I say all that to say this episode, the ending was very Whistler-esque. Uh, this was the type of ending you would uh, you would see on that program. You didn't think it mattered if people were treated well or not, you didn't give anything to anybody, and you thought it was irrelevant what your brother did, only to find yourself caught. A well-done uh, morality t tale with a strong twist here. And uh, we do have uh, one listener comment before we go. Uh, at, uh, Adam does a great job, really enjoy his podcast, and the videos are always a special uh, treat. Keep up the great podcast. You are appreciated, and that comes from over on Podcast Alley, where we encourage everybody to vote once a month at podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. Uh, give us a call, 208-991-4783, oh, and follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. But from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.